sir you are live very good evening my dear friends and welcome again to the beautiful series of the unique pg track program uh, initiative of delhi csi and i welcome you all uh, to the fifth webinar in the series and we have a great privilege of uh, having eminent panelists with us dr ramesh aroda she has been an eminent teacher ex director and head of the department of cardiology in gb pant hospital and madam currently is a consultant cardiologist at metro hospital we also have the privilege of having professor sebal mukhopadhyay with us sir is direct is director and head of the department of cardiology in gb pant hospital we have colonel cp roy with us who is vice president of delhi csi we have dr sebal dr safal who is associate professor of cardiology we have dr tarun with us who is also associate professor at rml hospital and most importantly we have we have today dr kamal sharma a eminent writer a young dynamic cardiologist and a great teacher he is a senior intervention cardiologist with vast experience with intervention cardiology but that does not define him what defines him is his academic skills and his teaching skills he has written a beautiful uh, book as you are already aware of that and uh, for pg track program only and he has more than 188 publications with many signs on his name so and he will be speaking on uh, one topic acute rheumatic fever without which i believe none of us would be sitting here or none of us would actually be uh, doing cardiology so acute rheumatic fever forms the backbone so what we are uh, going to listen to dr kamal today is that what we should be knowing it's a good pandora box a huge sea but he has picked up some beautiful clinical pearls and he will be enlisting all those pearls for us and uh, now over to you dr kamal for this presentation we look forward to learn from you a lot respected teachers and my seniors thank you professor mohit for inviting me for this talk uh, uh, it's a pleasure and I, i was just discussing before i started talking remembering those days before and we all used to be in those days running around and of course even then what used to be the backbone of remembering things and what we feared being asked most haunted most was acute rheumatic fever one thing that hasn't changed probably with the time is still that this is what is supposed to be one topic which you're supposed to know right inside out thoroughly when you appear for your exams and not only that even for your practice so it's starting right from what it defines as, is defined as and how the things are changing and um, I, it was a pleasure actually you know to dig up to uh, the articles that were updated in 20000 itself 2020 itself that i could come up with some wonderful publications from some of the panelists actually who could have some wonderful papers as i'll go take you through them and we'll discuss what it is so basically as we all know and this is very primitive thing but i think i should start with this only is that the acute rheumatic fever is a non suppurative sequelae that occurs two or four weeks following group a because that is shortly called as gabs pharyngitis and may consist of either or all of them which may differ according to the percentage which we will discuss as we proceed in the, ahead in the lecture arthritis carditis chorea arrhythmia marginatum subcutaneous nodules what ensues and what pierces and what brings this to the cardiology foray is of course the damage to the cardiac valves which may be chronic progressive and resulting in cardiac decompensation now when i mention non suppurative manifestation of gabs the next question that usually should come to your mind what are the other non suppurative manifestation that group a beta hemolytic streptococcus can cause and two of them that are also known to occur are scarlet fever and acute glomerulonephritis which of course is not the topic of the day so i'll skip upon that but just because i usually talk to my students that exam is a trick either you trick the examiner to ask you the next question or he tricks you to answer the question uh, that he wants so when you mention it's one of the non suppurative of course the next thing that crosses the examiner's mind is ask you what are the other non suppurative so that was i thought i'll just cover that so basically as i mentioned it's a non infectious autoimmune disorder an inflammatory disease which is linked to the pharyngeal infection and continues to be a problem worldwide and the cause of heart disease in children in developing countries and that's why a lot of pediatrics actually overlaps with the same coming to the epidemiology most that is more than 50% of the acute uh, acute rheumatic fevers are between 5 to 15 years of age and this accounts for 20 to 30% of cardiology admissions in of course non covid era 
find that one in five uh, patient would be a rheumatic heart disease that you're dealing with either with acute fever or without acute rheumatic fever. Worldwide, it is estimated that almost 4,70,000 new cases of acute and 2,75,000 deaths are attributable to uh, rheumatic heart disease each year. All of the references I've quoted for the same. So the incidence of the rheumatic fever in developing countries, it ranges from 27 to 100 per lakh per year with a mean being 19. In United States of America, of course, it's come down to below two per lakh. Highest rates are reported in indigenous Australians, which is Aborigines at around 153 to 380 cases per million uh, per, children, per lakh children, which is in the age group between five to 55 to 14, as we say. From India, the Developed countries, Dr. Sanani reported in Japan in 2006 that the incidence has gone below five, which was a generalization of the same. And it varies 0.2 to 0.75 per thousand per year in school going children, five to 15 years of age group. This was 2001 government consensus, which was again from Madam Padnavati and Dr. Grover's publication in 2002. The prevalence, of course, in India in children is between two to 11 per thousand which is with a mean of six per thousand. And in crowded places like Mumbai, which is again a publication by Dr. Sainani, it's in around the range of 15 per thousand. These are all the summaries and nutshell I thought of capturing uh, the prevalence studies. And there was a beautiful paper by Dr. Negi et al. in Indian Heart Journal, which summarized and looked at, to, at to all the kind of prevalence studies that existed. And I have taken this uh, slide from there. Uh, so this is the population-based surveys in India, with the authors being Roy, Mathur, Berry, Grover, and Nal Chandani et al. And these are the various areas from which it has been studied, right from, most of them have been in the north of India. And right from 1969 to 2000, you can see that the prevalence is actually not very much different as we are looking at the population-based surveys in India. But if you go back to the other uh, patterns of analyzing the same, the ICMRs has done a lot of studies. And all of them, if you look in the prevalence in the age groups, you can find, again, most of them predominantly from North India, barring code, Dr. Koshi's study from Vellore, the, the in the children growing age group, again, it ranges pretty much in the values that I mentioned ahead. But then there is this comparative study, which actually talks about whether the prevalence is actually going down. This is a school-based survey of prevalence of clinical screening of echocardiographic confirmation of heart disease, rheumatic heart disease. And you can see from 88 and beyond 2000 onwards, the numbers have started plummeting below one. So if you look at Kumar et al, Mishra et al, Perival et al, Neki et al, and Rama et al, all of them actually mention the prevalence to be less than one, which was barely a case before 2000, when most of the prevalence studies found it to be more than one. And hence, the, this point is now very often asked and discussed, is the prevalence going down? And this is, look at the ICMR, because the ICMR methodology has remained pretty much the same of analyzing the prevalence in the country. When you look at the 72 versus 84 versus 2001 to 2007 data, Again, you can see that the prevalence has gone down from 11 to 1.2. So this goes on to tell that the urbanization or the uh, as the economic well-being of the society started in India in the uh, era of the new century, I think the prevalence has started going down as most of the literature of the prevalence studies actually come. So these are the data that suggest the same. Now, is it that the Indians are just one subgroup or this, do they differ from the That subgroup, you can see, though they have looked at primarily acute heart failure, the prevalence of rheumatic also could, you can see that the valvular, it's 14% versus 7%. So we still have a lot of patients who actually come with heart failure, predominantly being valvular. So compared to probably the rest of the part of the Asia, we still have higher prevalence. This is the status, you can see the slides that I mentioned to you. Uh, the ICMR studies, again, the prevalence rate between one to three, and then the, the, the studies that happen later half, again, uh, actually going down to below one level. So prevalence levels slightly going down, incidence level also, we can claim the same. So this is, to, in nutshell, the Indian data. In school children, 
uh, Arthur et al. published a paper which said 1.8 with a mean of six of all the papers that were analyzed. And Madam Padmavati's paper in adults actually mentioned a rate of 1.25 to 2 per thousand. Again, this is much older paper. But when you look at the recent data, Carpetis et al. have given the world data with the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease to be 1.3 per thousand and of rheumatic fever as 19 per 1 lakh population clinically, which becomes almost 10 times if you include echo echo criteria in assessing the same. In India, the ICMR survey I already talked about has shown the prevalence of 0.2 to 1.1 per thousand and acute rheumatic fever incidence from 0.07 to 0.2 per thousand patients. School survey conducted by ACMR also showed prevalence below one per thousand population. Madam Anita Saxena's rheumatic study by Ames, which suggested prevalence of carditis as 0.8 per thousand clinically and 20 per thousand by echocardiographically. So incidence rates of acute rheumatic fever in India was reported by Kumar et al. as 8.7 per lakh between 5 to 14. So all of these studies that actually range in these subgroups, the values that I mentioned, and this was to summarize from where I am quoting those numbers. So these are various studies which I've talked about. Coming to pathogenesis, rheumatic fever, it occurs between one to five weeks after the streptococcal sore throat infection, the average being 19 days, some people say three weeks. Of course, the agent is group A, beta hemolyticus, gram positive cocci, uh, streptococcus, which is capsulated bacilli. Sometimes you're asked to describe the agent. So it's a gram positive cocci occurring in chains, which is capsulated with fimbria. And basically it's streptococcus pyogenes, which is beta hemolytic on blood agar. It's Lansfield group 19. And according to the carbohydrate antigen, you can include all from A to U except I to J. So the lens wheel group, is all but usually it's group A, which is primarily responsible for rheumato so-called rheumatogenic strains. Now, there is one important paper I could find out recently, which was published about EMM gene. So they found chromosome patterns of the streptococci. And of that, the EMM gene, which is labeled A to E, that code for the M and M-like cell surface, which are the virulence protein, actually is the gene responsible for deciding the virulence of this bacteria. Now, and the cross-reactivity and the autoimmune response to it. So group A streptococcus fall basically into two main classes based upon the difference in the C-repeat regions of this M protein and the pharyngeal patterns from A to C, whereas most of all, those who have skin disease by streptococcus, which is impatigo, those strains, they show D to E pattern. So in one of the papers in USA, when there was one of the recent, one of the not so old, but in 60s, 70s, when they had a rheumatic fever outbreak, they actually chased these serotype strains and they found out and labeled I'm some of the strains as rheumatogenic strains and some as the nephritogenic strains. So the rheumatogenic strains are 1, 3, 5, 6, 14, 12, 18, 19, 24, 27, and 29. Again, those that I've highlighted in the orange are the predominant ones, the 3, 5, 6, 14, 18, 19, and 24, and nephritogenic is 12 to 49. Now, this is again our issue, how Indians actually can differ. The rheumatogenic strains, though, were identified in US, and actually in India, the rheumatogenic strains are not the same. So there is another paper. So this, this was about the rheumatogenic strains in the America when they published the prevalence that it decreased two to five-fold, whereas the reduction in the incidence of ARF over the same period is more than 24s, which means that if these strains were only responsible for rheumatic fever to occur, then the decrease is not proportionate, but it is beyond the expectation. So you have two to five fold reduction in the strains, but rheumatic fever has gone down 20 times, which means that there is things beyond the, the strains itself, which is responsible. So there is a shift in prevalence of so-called rheumatogenic EMM types and does not appear to fully explain this decrease in acute rheumatic fever. So this is the basically uh, uh, from uh, the mechanism how the immune response is generated. When you have gas adhesion and invasion, you have processing and presentation by the B and T cells, which act, uh, the T cells with the T cell receptors go and process it, give it with the MHC class two to the macrophage. And this, the generation of cross-reactive B and T cells ultimately produce cross-reacting and with the tissues, which is the heart brain, which causes chorea, arthritis, and skin manifestation. So this is uh, a, a paper from 2016 at the on nature, 
which actually, and the slide I, uh, I acknowledge I've taken it from up to date, which mentions the uh, mechanism of cross-reactive immune response. Coming back to the Indian strains. So when you talk about rheumatogenic strains, there is a wonderful paper by Kumar R. et al., in, uh, published in 2009, which actually told that actually you don't find those strains in India. So when data outside US are considered, the classic rheumatogenic strains are not observed. So that rheumatogenic strains actually fall primarily in the American continent. In India, it doesn't hold true. Even in that part, in Hawaii, eight of the 63 patients with ARF and gas isolated on 65, 69, 71, 92, 93, 98, 103, 122. And none of these EMM types are classically associated with the RAVN or belong to DNA pattern. And the same kind of data was available from Ethiopia and in India. And I've quoted the Indian studies, which says that actually those rheumatogenic strains, so-called, are not the most prevalent strains in India. This is another paper which again talked about CD44, which is several factors may affect the site of infection. And even the bacterial factors can impact it. So why certain strains cause it and why others don't? The factors that affect localization to the pharynx may be CD44. The CD44 is a hyaluronic acid binding protein that appears to act on the pharyngeal receptors of the gas. So just like we now in COVID era are talking about ACE2, Similarly, for rheumatic, probably we never had that insight in the past, but now we know it's CD44. So after intranasal inoculation, gas colonize uh, the oropharynx in wild-type mice, but not transgenic mice who do not express CD44. And this has though not been studied, but probably this is one of the new sites that we all probably should be contemplating and understanding for rheumatic. And this is uh, from uh, Dr. Seibel's actually. This paper actually published again in Indian art which is about Tregs. So you have uh, regulatory cells, the T sites, which are regulatory cells and the attack cells, as we know. So the level uh, analyzed in this beautiful paper, and they showed that actually the autoimmune response is primarily because the regulatory cells are not to the extent that it, they should be. So the levels of Tregs as analyzed by CD4, CD25, CD127, FOXP, in CD4, lymphocytes were significantly lower in rheumatic heart patients as compared to the normal patients, uh, with no difference in, of course, in t This actually tells you that there is a significant deficiency in circulatory T regulatory cells of the chronic rheumatic heart disease, which may be actually responsible for the damage that ensues. And that's why even they found out that in multivalvular, it was more than in single valve. So this was a paper in 2015. So that brings us to the molecular mimicry. Now, which part of the bacilli is what cross-reacts and causes the damage to the, uh, the body tissues? So in carditis, if you're asked to be very specifically to point out, it would be alpha helical protein structures of M protein and NABAG, so which is N-acetyl beta D-glucosamine, which shares its epitopes with myosin. And the myosin, of course, we know, but what epitope of the bacteria? This is the this epitope. And the antibody that cross reacts is, of course, demonstrated in multiple strategies, and I've given the references for the same. For chorea, of course, it's the monoclonal bodies that cross react with C4C. Chorea is caudate nucleus. That's how I remember uh, in my undergraduate days, and uh, that's how it still remembers that part of neurology. So that chorea is bound by the, again, NABG and the mammalian lysogangliosides. So that's what cross -reacts. So genetic susceptibility. So that's about the whole, the environmental factors, the pathogen factors. Let's talk about the genetic factors and how the people can differ. I just showed you some of the slides of CD uh, of the Tregs and some about CD44. There is some other meta-analysis about even twin studies. So when they pulled the proban-wise concordance risk, it was found that the 44% of monozygotic twins and only 12% of digozygotic twins had the likelihood of the disease. So this association uh, of zygosity and concordance was very strong with an odds ratio of 6.4. So if you, this goes on to prove that there is an underlying genetic susceptibility. So the first study that conducted among 2,500 plus individuals in seven countries in Oceania, it observed that the susceptibility signal, it lies in the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus, suggesting a central role of humoral immunity in pathogenesis of rheumatic fever. In one of the second studies, which was again in 1200 plus individuals of 
aborigines of Australia, they found out the variation in class two regions of HLA, so human leukocyte antigen, uh, which is consistent with other multiple smaller studies. Now, there is another theory which people call a two-hit hypothesis. Sometimes you may be asked, what is a two-hit hypothesis? So there is double geoparty that takes place when a rheumatic disease ensues, a rheumatic fever ensues. One is the cross-reaction and molecular mimicry that happens with the epitopes that I just mentioned on the cell wall, and then that cross-reacts with the host antigen. But secondly, sometimes you can have T-cell invasions also happening. And the antigen-antibody complex at the target site invites T-lymphocytes to come out of the vessels and stimulate local epithelioid uh, cells to form so-called its curve or the caterpillar giant cells as we knew them around the fibrinoid degeneration that is happening. And this is what forms the Ashoff gibel bodies that we find. So Ashoff's nodules, as we understand, this is a hematologic, this is a microscopic structure of the same. You can see this is a classical rheumatic granuloma. So you may be asked to sometimes describe it which is the collagen, the fibrinoid necrosis, the artery at the periphery. And of course, you have Ashoff giant cells and the plasma cells of the lymphocytes. So you have Ashoff body, which is first described by Safir, which is less than one mm actually in diameter. But Enishkov giant cells, which is the classical appearance that you find, which is shown here, which is called the Auli appearance because of the nuclei. And it's a giant cell of basophilic histiocyte, caterpillar cells. And of course, then you have the necrosis forming the completion of the um, granuloma or the Ashoff bodies. So there are various phases which actually at the microscopic level and the pathological level that the rheumatic fever ensues. The phases, of course, is the fibrinoid proliferative phase or a granulomatous phase, and then you have scarring in the fibrotic phase. So we know from the autopsy series is that most of the times the endocardium is where you may maximally find histological 72%. It's the myocardium, it's only 5%. LA appendage is 18%, but it's never found in aorta and very, very rarely in papillary muscle. So structures where you don't find them is aorta and sometimes uh, in uh, papillary muscles. Now, when you look at the spectrum, let's come to the spectrum of rheumatic heart disease in India. Indian patients are typically younger than the Western counterparts. They have multivalvular involvement. They have multiple episodes. There is rapid progression. There is high incidence of complications like atrial fibrillation, embolism, heart failure. And there is, of course, problem associated with the profile axis and treatment, sticking to the long-term therapies of the penicillin profile axis that may be required. And all that can also be an issue when you have to tackle rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever in India. So now when you actually encounter them at the first point of contact, when you can actually suspect is the GARPS infection. So that's basically done. The group A streptococcal infection is diagnosed by what is called as Centaur criteria. And the criteria have been modified. Now they're called as modified Centaur criteria, where you include in the age of the patient. So if the age is less than 15, you add one point, more than 45 or 44, you subtract one and it remains zero for 15 to 45. But there are four pillars to diagnose it. One, history of temperature more than 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, you must excuse me, it looks 380, but it's 38 degree. Uh, toss and tonsillar exudates, tender uh, anterior cervical lymph node, lymphadenopathy, and absence of cough. These four, if present, each have one point, and then you have plus one or minus one for this. So your score can range from minus one for of all the four being absent, and you have age more than 45, you lined up with minus one, two plus five, and you have all of them present. So minus one to one, you know, don't need to give any antibiotic or do a throat culture as per the modified CEN2 criteria. But if your score is between two to three, you should receive a throat culture, treat with the antibiotic culture is positive, Risk of streptococcal infection is almost 32% if the three of the criteria is present and 15% if only two of them are present. But if your score is four or five, you need to rapidly consider a rapid streptococcal testing or a culture with the risk infection is actually going up to 56%. Now, when you look at the, why is it so important? When you look at the interval between the first episode and the onset of the symptoms, these were some of the various baseline studies and you we know from bland uh, bland series, et cetera, which were happening in early 50s in USA or later 50s in USA, that the interval ranged almost 17 to 20 to 30 years, even in Sweden and with Hall's data, we know it's almost 29 years that you had first episode 
and of uh, rheumatic fever and you have the onset of symptoms of rheumatic heart disease. But Chaco had shown way back in 1979 that it's not more than a decade. So almost a decade earlier, just like coronary artery disease happening almost a decade earlier, rheumatic actually had shown it much before that. So in India, onset of symptoms from the initial attack can actually some data now say up to between three years to 11 years, much earlier. And you can have actually a fulminant carditis and actually acute rheumatic fever itself presenting with the episode. So this ranges how uh, the manifestations of chronic disease uh, is taken over rather than the acute phase compared to West where it's almost 22 decades. Severe valve lesion from the initial attack ranges from 5 to 20 years is almost 31 years in Western data. And the age of intervention is usually, as we know, we do a lot of balloon mitrals. Uh, Panth does a lot of balloon mitrals. Our institute, your method, does a lot of balloon mitrals. But we see those numbers dwindling, actually. We remember our days, and I, I remember Dr. Seibel's days, for some kind of record for the Panth Institute itself, when they have done huge number of balloons in a single day. And the age of the intervention would be second or third decade, where it will be fourth or fifth decade in West. Now, this is a common question. What percentage of patients get carditis? Now, this varies from various data, Indian literature, Western literature, what series you're looking at. But I have tried to bring it down from the AHA circulation Jones revised 2015 guideline. And this is the percentage from that. So what it says that the carditis and vulvitis, including clinical and subclinical, is 50 to 70 percent. Arthritis is 35 to 66 percent. So usually the old rule as we were residents, we were taught two third will have carditis, one third will have arthritis, one tenth or one fifth would have chorea. Nodules will be in one tenth. You forget it because Asians hardly ever get it. So this is how we remembered. But now to document that for all the literature that must have been reviewed by Gwets et al. by publishing the revision of Jones criteria in 2015. These are the percentages I thought I should share with you. But then, of course, as I said, Indians differ very differently. Indians behave very differently. What data we find in 2015 published in the American Heart Journal may not be completely extrapolated and assumed to be so uh, in India. So let me, let's me let just go through some of the series. That Dr. Sanyal's series, though 102 patients only, it, this is from where we talked about. This is what we learned. Two-third and one-third, 66 have arthritis, one-third have carditis. Korea is 15 to 20 percent, nodules in 3 percent, erythema marginitum in less than 5 percent. Uh, though some series actually mentioned arthritis less than 50 percent, but arthralgia was reported in the majority of them. Dr. Padmavati series mentioned 70 percent of arthritis, 30 percent in carditis, 9 percent chorea, 2 percent nodules. And this is from where we were taught that forget erythema in Indians, that you had 0 percent in Madam Padmavati series of erythema marginitum. If you look at the carditis in the first episode, again, Dr. Sanyal series showed 30% incidence, but Dr. Cherian series showed that the likelihood of a rheumatic patient getting an episode in a lifetime is almost 90%. So 90% of Indian rheumatic fevers will have at least one episode of carditis with a 90% chance in his lifetime to get carditis. So, in India, incidence of carditis may be much higher. If 50 to 70% is reported in the literature, it may be higher than that. Maybe Madam Padmavati is 70% or Dr. Cherian 70%, 90% is somewhere in a lifetime is what we are probably dealing with. Though, of course, arthritis remains a dominant symptom. There are some important first percentages and numbers to remember. I thought I'll include this, and this is, I'm, you, you must excuse me, there'll be some snaps like this, which I which were easy to copy from my book, and that's why you find those question numbers. You must excuse me for that. But this, these are some certain comments, and I've given you the sub-references there. The latent period for beta hemolytic streptococcus sore throat to rheumatic fever mean is 19 days. I mentioned one week to five weeks, but mean is 19 days. The latent period of chorea, though, is one to six months. So we were taught three weeks to six weeks and six weeks to six months. That's how carditis and chorea differ uh, in their latent periods. Again, what percentage, this was a common question that we used to ask, if this is a class of 100 and we all were to get beta hemolytic streptococcus sore throat in a mass, what would the likelihood that we will develop rheumatic fever? So only 3% in epidemic. So out of a class of 100, only 3% in epidemic and only 03 in endemic areas. So 
it's not that anybody who gets a streptococcus this is much lower and this is a well documented percentage from various studies so amongst again why is it so that why the sore throats don't translate because amongst all pharyngitis 80% are viral of course now we know even covid only 20% are bacterial amongst those bacterial 30% are gabs of those gabs 0.3 untreated in endemic and 3% of um, in epidemics will end up with rheumatic fever a positive throat culture for gabs is suspected rheumatic fever is it's it's one of the north indian series is only 13.1% so its yield is also very low so symptoms of febrile illness versus neurologic illness in acute rheumatic fever as is again from the up to date this i've taken a slide there are two presentations that can exist when you can have an acute febrile illness with acute fever or you can have a neurologic illness which is part of the chorea so as i mentioned this is to summarize the same 2 to 4 weeks here it's 2 to 6 months gas of course fever is common there's no fever acute joint involvement scarditis skin manifestations raised markers evidence of preceding gas which is as or adb uh, which will be elevated dramatic response to aspirin and sids duration is usually less than 6 weeks and you need to follow up for residual rheumatic heart disease while in rheumatic neurologic manifestations you may have no fever usually behavioral disorder distinctive chorea carditis more than 30% often subclinical normal inflammatory markers as often helpful but this is the one place where you do do, you do nt dnas b which is the best diagnostic method, methodology in serology for neurologic manifestations and it is followed by rheumatic heart disease in 50% much lesser than the acute febrile manifestation now what kind of valves are involved there are again two important ones is the fenstein series again from the west was 50 70 to 75% involved Penstein again did another series, and then they found out they clubbed it with the valves. So there were two publications from it, and one is the mitral with aortic, which says 20 to 25 percent. Isolated aortic is only 5 to 8 percent. Tricuspid is 30 to 50 percent. So hence, when you add it up all total, mitral involvement happens in almost 90 to 90 percent, 92 percent, and total aortic involvement happens only in one third, that is 30 to 35 percent. This is from the Penstein data. there is another data from india which is dr manjunath series in rheumatic heart disease involvement was mitral in 60% followed by aortic tricuspid and rarely ever pulmonary we know that mitral stenosis was exclusively of rheumatic etiology in almost 97% isolated mr was rheumatic in 41% followed by an mvp which is of course a mix uh, they were looking at the valvular uh manifestations and all the kind of disorders and that's what the paper was all about and then you have degenerative calcification was most common cause of isolated as followed by bavs bicuspid aortic valves so more than one third cases had multiple valves and then they found out that ms with mr was more common with ms with ar followed by mr with ar followed by as with ar followed by mr with as and the least was ms with as so this was the real world scenario the database of uh, valvular heart disease by dr manjunath et al which was again published um, uh, in a reputed journal now this is another commonly asked terminology very unique for our part of the continent which is called as juvenile mitral stenosis first described by uh, sb roy and then dr agrawal modified it so it's a accelerated process of sclerosis and fusion uh, which act, takes place in the young children uh, it constitutes one third of all cases of dominant ms and it's 10 to 15% of cases of rheumatic heart disease initially it was described till 20 years and then it was modified by dr agrawal et al as to 18 years so um, any mitral stenosis with that age cut off is called as juvenile mitral stenosis the predominant thing is that the cardiac symptoms rather than joint manifestation is what brings the patient to the physician how it differs there is fusion of the pathologically there is fusion of the cusp there is more severe subvalvular fusion there are fixed fibrotic valve with no calcification they are mobile cusp with commissural fusion and hence they are suitable valves though with some risk because of subvalvular pathology for balloon mitrals mobile cusp with commissural fusion they usually have associated mild mr and very often they have severe bh another important thing is they are usually in sinus rhythm they don't end up with an atrial fibrillation sub valve pathology and fusion are present in these patients so roughly to remember what suitable is what you get in now then comes the history you know sometimes who's father of this who's father of that who fathered this and who fathered that so i thought i'll summarize all fathers together in one history in rheumatic heart where it can be so father of rheumatism is gulliard de bulle father of rheumatic fever is bulle 
uh, first to de describe mitral stenosis was Bucin's. Chorea mollis was described by Sydenham. That's why we call it Sydenham's chorea. Association between chorea and rheumatism actually was done by Addison, not by Sydenham. So Sydenham just mentioned it as a chorea, but it was Addison, the Addison of Addison, Addisonian crisis and Addison's disease was the one who actually found out association between chorea and rheumatism. Subcutaneous nodules were discovered by William Wells and Barlow Werner. Rheumatic angina was described. That's why you ask sometimes, why do you get angina in mitral stenosis? So, which is again not part of the history. I should stick to the topic that I'm given acute rheumatic fever. So, rheumatic angina was described by Trogio. Uh, describing all manifestation points time together was Chiedl. Beta hemolysis was done by Scott Muller. Slide agglutination by Griffith. Immune precipitation by, of course, Lansfield. That's how you get the Lansfield classification. It was McLagan who first described treatment with salicylate. Pelicillin prophylaxis was done by the biggest study called it. If you are asked any big study, which was the first one of the studies, it was Irvington House cohort done by Stolerman. I don't know with the new generation, but we belong to a generation where Stolerman used to be a book, which we all used to read for acute rheumatic fever. And believe me, that's from where my basis of most of the slides of the history have come up from, including this slide, the Stolerman textbook. Uh, of uh, rheumatic, acute rheumatic fever till Jagat Narula happened. Everybody read that. So father of modern rheumatic fever was Duckett Jones, and that's why we know Duckett Jones criteria. And reaction between gaps in rheumatic fevers was defined by Colis. Phases of rheumatic fever, which is like streptococcal tonsillitis, immunologic havoc, acute rheumatic fever, all were described by Coburn. And the copathogen effect was described by Brook. I will come and discuss copathogen effect as I proceed in my lecture. Now, bringing to the Duckett Jones criteria, which was he is Duckett Jones is an Australian. Some people are fancy of examiners are fancy of asking where did which country he belonged to find. So I'm telling you, he was an Australian. So in 1944, he published the original Duckett Jones criteria. Uh, and then, of course, then they were revised to the 2015 updates. So I'll just go to till what we read in the high risk and low risk, moderate and major. So this is what it basically is for all patients with evidences of group A, beta hemolytic streptococcus you need for initial diagnosis of rheumatic fever, two major or one major plus two minor, or even recurrent, you need two major or one major or two minor or even three minor. Um, the major, it, you decide the population groups into two groups, which is low risk and moderate risk, and then the major and the minor, and I'll proceed ahead and show it another slide. But of course, major and minor is less than two is what we talk about as the incidence of less than two per uh, one lakh versus a prevalence of less than one per thousand. So we always knew the original Duckett Jones as they were modified as to the major and the minor criteria. But you have to remember this all started changing with the three exceptions. And these were very commonly asked our MCQ questions. The three exceptions were all except. So all the three exceptions where you these do, did not apply when this major and minor of were happening was the chorea, indolent carditis, and recurrence of rheumatic fever. Actually, this is what triggered the new change that came into the guidelines. So, original criteria by Jones were carditis, arthralgia, not arthritis, chorea, nodules, history of previous rheumatic fever, and minor were huge. You had abdominal pain, you had epistaxis. So you, you can get these kind of minor manifestations, but they were not considered as a minor criteria now anymore. But initially, he mentioned these two, abdominal pain, precordial pain, even angina, he mentioned epistaxis, pulmonary findings of uh, pneumonitis, ECG abnormality, erythema marginatum, anemia, uh, elevated total count, raised ESR, all as minor criteria. This changed in 65, when for the first time, arthralgia was replaced by polyarthritis, and minor actually dumped away with the epistaxis and abdominal pain and angina, et cetera. And of course, then you had recent scarlet fever coming in uh, as one of the, again, it got amended. Uh, and then you had in 84, uh, the ASO coming in with more than 400 as a cutoff. And in 92, of course, still we knew for a long, long time, uh, the five major carditis, arthritis, polyarthritis, chorea, erythema marginatum, and subcutaneous nodule as major. And then the previous history and arthralgia and fever as minor, and the, the labs and the ECG as the end, the supporting evidences of the positive culture and the rising or elevated titers, which was published in JAMA in 92, Dajani et al. And then the diagnosis of rheumatic fever hence required these criteria. And these were analyzed 
when they found out that the sensitivity of the Jones criteria is 77% and specificity is 97%. So these are two important studies, WHO study and Marcus et al, which looked into the Jones criteria and that stood at their, their test of time because of these good numbers that they show with 77% sensitivity and 97% specificity. Now, with to improve sensitivity, the some more criteria need to come and that's happened in 2015. So this is that flowchart. Now, what does this flowchart tell you? This is a flowchart which actually is nothing but the same table. It tells you that if you find a clinically, it's in straight away. If no, you can't make it that it's definitely chorea, then you of course do an echo and then you rule it out. Arthritis, if there is no carditis with a negative echodoppler, two minor criteria or other major criteria, ARF is diagnosed, no criteria, alternative diagnosis. Clinical carditis or subclinical echodoppler carditis, again, ARF is diagnosed. Clinical carditis by echo, it confirms one minor only, probably ARF, repeat echo at 13 to 21 days. So this is from 2015 guidelines. You need to repeat an echo for a suspected clinical carditis where only one minor criteria is present. So you may be asked, will you repeat an echo in a patient where you suspect, suspected, so they've introduced one more term called suspected rheumatic fever. In that subgroup, you have a suspected carditis and everything else is not falling into picture. You may have to repeat an echo in two to three weeks. Subcutaneous nodule or erythema, other major or one minor is required, two minor are required to diagnose them, not alone would suffice. Uh, no major or and or one minor, you will have to consider alternative diagnosis. So this is what it means. This is this in, in all it means that if you're dealing with a low risk population, if there is carditis, clinical and sub and or subclinical arthritis, polyarthritis only, chorea, erythema marginatum, subcutaneous nodule, they are the major ones. Low risk population, the minor ones are polyarthralgia, fever more than 38.5, uh, ESR more than 60 in the first hour and CRP more than three. Um, prolonged PR interval after accounting for the age variability. In moderate risk, the cutoff values are different. ESR is less, more than 30. Uh, CRP remains unaltered. And as you can see, monoarthritis or polyarthralgia are also considered a major criteria in moderate to high-risk population. Again, in high-risk population, minor criteria, you don't require polyarthralgia, only monoarthralgia will do. So this is what level of evidence, I'll just touch upon that. It was published in circulation. It's reasonable to consider individuals to be low risk for ARF if they come from a setting or population known to experience low rate of ARF on RHD, which is class 2A, evidence level C. It's reasonable that where reliable epidemiological data are available, less than two per lakh school going children and usually five to 14 years per year or an age prevalence of rheumatic heart disease less than one. This is class 2A level of evidence C. Children not clearly from low risk group are at moderate high risk. So anything other than this becomes uh, moderate to high risk. And this has got the highest level, which is class one level of evidence C. So highest level is for moderate and high risk. So I assume that the Asian in Asia and the continent of high incidence is having more strong and robust data to get a class one indication or approval for the same. So this is what it means, the low risk and high risk. And again, two major or one major plus two minor are sufficient for diagnosis. And history of uh, acute rheumatic fever, risk of subsequent episode of ARF with gas and reinfection and repeat episodes are associated with great likelihood of severe cardiac involvement. Two major, one major plus two minor or three minor are sufficient to diagnose the same. So this is what it is, that the major criteria include monoarthritis uh, or polyarthritis, of course, and polyarthritis considered as a major after exclusion of other cause. Minor criteria, monoarthralgia rather than polyarthralgia. Fever cutoff is different. Here it is 100.4 versus 101.3 in the low risk group. Again, cutoff of ESR is different as I said, 30 and 60. So this is the World Heart, uh, uh, Health Association of Diagnosis. First episode, you apply Jones. Recurrent episode in a patient without established RHD, same as the first episode. Recurrent episode with established RHD, you require two minor Jones 
Um, so there is this term which was introduced in 15, which is called as possible rheumatic fever, where there is genuine uncertainty. We don't know actually. You're not able to, despite everything, whether you're actually dealing with rheumatic fever. It's reasonable to consider offering 12 months of secondary prophylaxis. So when in doubt, you treat. It's unlike the other disease. Here, they, in high prevalence groups, you need to, in doubt, still you give 12 months of secondary prophylaxis, followed by re-evaluation to include a careful history and exam. In addition to repeat an echo, it's a class 2A level C indication. In patients with recurrent symptoms who have been adherent to prophylaxis but lack serological evidence and lack echocardiographic evidence, it is reasonable to conclude that the symptoms are not ARF. And in this group, you can discontinue antibiotic prophylaxis. Again, here evidence is class 2A level evidence C. So two subgroups are falling into this category. One in doubt, you treat. And when in doubt, you want to stop. When both the conditions, they have highly... Uh, elucidated here very well. Again, frequency of major manifestations, if you can see, again, this coming back to Dr. Roy's and Dr. Tandon's series I also wanted to touch upon. So this, the slide which is very much messes with Dr. Sanya's series and uh, 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 even Dr. Madam Padmavati's series. So carditis, 80% of patients that develop carditis in the first two weeks of onset is what it is. So within first two weeks, they will get it. And it's a pancarditis. Affects the endo all the three layers. Predominant effect is the scarring. MR is the hallmark. AR is less common. Endocarditis, which is mitral valve disease, is 70 to 75%. And I've touched upon this from the Kinare autopsy series, where isolated aortic stenosis was rare, uh, uh, which is in 1972. Um, there is another data which showed that tricuspid is very much more common in India, again from Kinare series, which said that the tricuspid involvement was very high as compared to the Western population. So isolated though is very rare, but involvement with mitral and aortic in 11% in West and in India, almost one third of the patients will have it. So this is the Datta series, another series which was which preceded Kinare series, which was a bigger series. You can see that almost everyone had a mitral valve disease and tricuspid was almost in one third. Aortic was in one half and 100% in mitral. So 100% mitral, 50% aortic, and one third a tricuspid and almost 0%. Though Kinare series showed 7%, that's how it differs from the Tha series about an occurrence involvement of pulmonary. So pulmonary is rare, but it's not that it is never involved in mitral my rheumatic heart disease. So another common thing is that why do you get Kerikum murmur? Previously, people called it a murmur of mitral valvitis, but now we have known that it's primarily not just the valvitis so called, but of course, it is a, a blowing murmur that you had of the MR, which is associated with carry cooms. It's a short mid-diastolic murmur, which is heard loudest at the apex, an indicator of moderately severe MR, which is causing the ventricular filling and causing the mid-diastolic rumble. So it's a severe MR, which acutely onsets, leads to a mid-diastolic rumble, is another theory why it's not just the valvitis or valpro but it is actually a prognostic marker of a severe MR that is underlying causing a carry comb to happen. So mechanisms are, of course, the older. Why does the valve get valvitis? What causes it? The older theory was that the mitral valve edema, contracture, cord lengthening, all lead to it. But now we know that histopathologically from the current series is that's due to the annular dilatation and cordal elongation of the anterior mitral leaflet which leads to the prolapse and hence altered coaptation, which is where you get most of the MRs are posteriorly directed. And that's why you get the endocardial thickening on that side of the so-called McCollum's patch. So clinically, of course, you'll get soft F1, gallop, murmur, cardiomegaly, CCF, and severe MR, and myocardial necrosis, which is rare. Pericarditis can also happen in 15% of the patients. It indicates underlying carditis. It's a frictional rub associated with serosanguinous effusion. Effusion always resolves without sequelae. In 2 to 8%, you can have silent carditis. There is no evidence of carditis, only histology. If you do a biopsy, you will find it. So the yield of endomyocardial biopsy is very low compared to the risk of the procedure. And hence, it's not done in classical acute rheumatic fever to, to diagnose the same. Because you have good sensitivity and yield of the modified zones, the updated zones, you don't need an invasive procedure. It's not that you'll not get it, but there's no point of doing it when you can diagnose it in non-invasively. Because for that 2% or 2 to 8% of silent carditis also, you'll have other parameters to assess it and pick it up. So you first attack, you'll get new murmur, apical systolic, carry comb, aortic regurg, 
recurrences are diagnosed by changed murmur, new murmur, worsening of heart failure, rubs, or even conduction abnormalities or eco-imaging or biopsy criteria. So to summarize, original Jones, erythema was a minor criteria. There was no distinction between arthralgia and arthritis. Epistaxis, abdominal pain, pulmonary findings, lab investigations were not there. Modified in 56, they came. When arthritis became a major criteria, arthralgia became a minor criteria. Epistaxis, abdominal pain, pulmonary finding, all were removed. In revised Jones, in 65, they added streptococcal. In reviewed Jones 84, the added premature NSAID administration was discouraged and the usefulness of ACO was evaluated. So this was surprising for the NSAIDs. And then the updated 92, they only they mentioned it very clearly that this is only for the first episode. The exceptions were defined. And then you had reaffirmed in 2002. And then, of course, in 2015, which I have talked about. So polyarthritis now we talk about its incidence is almost, as I said, two-third more than two-third patients. Asymmetric migratory, usually large joints, weight-bearing joints, because these are the joints which have maximum friction. Not non-weight-bearing, small joints are rarely involved. Axial joints are rarely involved. They are characterized by rubor, pallor, calor, dalor, as we knew, redness, swelling, pain, limitation of movement, and of course, the functional lazy, the five signs of uh, inflammation that we, 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 we were taught in pathology. So polyarthritis is usually disproportionate to symptoms. The findings are disproportionate. Joints are involved at various intervals. So it's like skips the joint as they call. So it bites the heart and skips the joint. So you have one joint, it skips. Once joint is involved, it resolves in some time and then you have a second joint happening. So there is a dramatic response to aspirin. Aspirate will yield more than 10,000 white cells Patients treated with NSAIDs early in the course of ARF before the other signs and symptoms of ARF become distinct may appear to have monoarthritis rather than polyarthritis. And now we know that arthralgia, which is more objective symptom and the joint does not show any signs. So you can have migratory arthritis like this. Terminologies when you deal with arthritis. One is PSRA, which is post-streptococcal reactive arthritis. Another is Jacquard's arthritis. The PSRA is basically after a after a short latent period only, one to two, one and a half week of sore throat that does not respond to salicylate and usually associ not associated with other findings. It does not involve the heart. While Jacquard's is a rare condition, not due to true synovitis, but it's primarily periarticular fibrosis of metacarpophalangeal joint and found in severe rheumatic heart disease, but without evidence of rheumatic fever. So this is Jacquard's arthritis, involves small joints, correctable deformity, was thought to be due to rheumatic fever, but never proved. And PSRA, as I said, is again a dramatic response, but no other signs. So usually occurs early, lasts for longer periods, small joints are involved, and there is no carditis. It's a separate entity because of these various reasons that I mentioned. Even acute phase reactants tend to be lower as compared to the acute rheumatic. And there are, of course, extra-articular manifestations like tenosynovitis, renal abnormality, which you find in PSRA. So PSRA will have Tenosynovitis and renal abnormality. Renal you rarely ever find unless an embolic phenomena in acute rheumatic fever. So differential diagnosis of arthritis is often asked. So post PSRA is one, septic, gonococcal, SBE, viral, juvenile, tuberculosis, HIV, henoxenlin, uh, Lyme's disease, hepatitis B, serum sickness, gynostitis, gynostitis syndrome in hepatitis B. So that the list is endless. I, I just... You, you can have differentials which are given in various books. Coming to St. Vitus dance. So St. Vitus was a, which is called a Sittenham Scoria. This, the St. Vitus was because the patients of Korea and Europe would walk up to the St. Vitus church to meet him. And because the travel and the journey used to be so long of three weeks or so that the Korea probably would disappear even otherwise. But they believed that this pilgrimage to the St. Vitus led to the recovery and complete cure of Korea. And hence the disease came to be known as St. Vitus dance and hence the rheumatic Korea. So it's a series of Korea, of course, as we know, is a jerky, non-repetitive, quasi-purposive involuntary movements, especially of face and with extremities and emotional liability. Caudate nucleus is where it cross-reacts. Latent period is three months or longer. Patient does not fill Jones criteria even then. As I mentioned in the flowchart, incidence is 20%. Common in children up to 7 to 14 in females, self-limiting, usually no relapse, and a very high incidence of chronic heart disease of 22 to 
Four signs are usually what people ask. Um, I think this is a neurology thing, but in exam you can be asked or you may be asked to explain these four clinical signs which a cardiologist should know because chorea can present to you and you end up missing a rheumatic fever. Dinner fork deformity, pronator drift, milkmaid's grape, and jack-in-the-box tongue. So these are the four classical signs. Spooning or as called dinner fork deformity, child is seated with the arm extended fully forward from the shoulder, hands are pronated and fingers are widespread. The typical finding of symmetric hyperextension of metacarpophalangeal joint. Uh, so the arm and the hand look like a spoon. And this is most often symmetric, but may be seen prominently on one side. Both proximal and distal chorea also, uh, it may also be noted. Pronator drift when a child is seated. So remember, this is how you may be asked to demonstrate. The child is seated with the arms and hands fully extended, up and palms facing each other. And this typical finding is the pronation of the hands. The hands pronate, and there is a flexion of the elbow. So this is a pronator drift. Milkmaid grip, the child is asked to use both hands to grip both of the examiner's index and the middle finger. And because of the chorea and hypotonic intrusions, the child, the, it, it appears as if the child is milking the cow. So causing the child to partly release his or grip only to regrip again is what is called as milkmaid's grip. Darting tongue or a jack-in-the-box tongue when the child is asked to stick or his or her tongue out of the mouth. Because of the involuntary movements, the child will grip the tongue with the teeth so that the trunk can stay out. So this motor command cannot be maintained when the child withdraws repeatedly. It keeps coming, going and out. And again, to hold it, sometimes the child may try to press it with against his teeth to grab the tongue to keep the tongue protruded. So you can have other manifestations also, which is emotional liability, irritability, obsessive compulsive behaviors. My so we had patients who had seizures and came to a psychiatrist and then they came to us. So uh, you can have these kind of manifestations. Don't think seizure is not, not your cup of tea. Always put a stethoscope. Just look at it if you're dealing with a chorea. And can it be rheumatic, especially in a child? How do you treat it? You, of course, previously we all used to think of haloparitis is you have more safer drugs, high potency D2 receptor blockers, which is flu, flufenazine and pimozide. A potential complication of this is, of course, akathasia and dystonia, which can be treated with benztropine, milder form of uh, sitonym's chorea, or when clinicians or family are reluctant to try it, you can even try clonidine, guafenazine, valparate, carbamazepine, all of them drugs, they work well for the chorea. Skin manifestations, nodules can be up to 20%. And it's been said that in Asians, it's much more than the Western population. It's a late manifestation. It indicates presence of underlying carditis. They are firm, painless, movable, 0.5 to 3 centimeter in size, over bony prominences, extended tendons, elbows, knees, wrists, ankles, vertebra, occiput region, medial border scapula, appear in crop and disappear in 2 to 3 months, which is 8 to 12 weeks. The mest manifestation, as people sometimes the examiner asks you, ask the child to squat and sit down and hangs hanging on the knee. And then you examine the knee, look at the chin of the tibia, examine the occiput, also look at the back of the spine and see over the scapula. So you have to look at all these regions where it can be present by palpation. So this is how it looks like. You can have small nodules. And for examining, as I said, you ask the patient to squat, keep the elbows on the knees, wrists are folded, and now palpate the shin, exterior aspect of the elbows, scalp, occiput, mid back, over and around spine and scapula. This is another important term which was first though described by Massel in way back 1937, but it was much modified later on by Bhattacharya and then Dr. Professor Raj Tandon again made his own seminal paper on the same artificial or subcutaneous artificial or uh, subcutaneous nodule where 1.5 ml of subcutaneous autologous blood on the elbow was injected and a nodule was created and then you found out active carditis ensuing. It was Bhattacharya et al. who replicated the same. Once you find the autologous subcutaneous nodule happening after four to seven days, its specificity was almost 100%, though the sensitivity was low. Vasan again modified the test and used only the white cell concentrate 3 ml of venous blood, sterile tubes, buffy coat was removed. Uh, by removing the plasma, you find out the buffy coat and then you inject that. So uh, this was uh, sensitivity of 86%, specificity of 94%, simple and expensive, safe and sensitive investigation. This was published by Dr. Raj Tandon uh, in Indian Heart Journal in 2005. 
Coming to endomyocardial biopsy, Dr. Jagat Narula, 1993, he published his own 54 suspected cases of RV biopsy, where he noted the Ashok nodules in 39% of the cases. Biopsy did not provide any additional information. And that's one of the reasons why people don't recommend a biopsy now, because the clinical criteria have become so prominent and so strong to pick up a suspected case with other modalities like serology or echocardiography. No single symptom sign or lab test is diagnostic and Jones must assist and not substitute clinical judgment as was quoted by Madam Anita Saxena in the IJP. Arrhythm marginatum, its incidence in Western population is very high. In Indians, as I said in uh, one of the series, it's almost zero. Early or late manifestation, it indicates an underlying carditis. It's usually on trunks and proximal extremities. Serpiginous erythematous maculopapular non pruritic rash, which extends outwards with central clearing with no residual scar and may disappear or appear very frequently within minutes to hours. So this is how it looks like at the marginatum. And this is another one. So again, when you age of onset is preschool versus school going in uh, arrhythma marginatum and uh, the nodules are common, but arrhythma marginatum is rare. Joint involvement is more in arthralgia, multivalvular, organic tricuspid involvement, indolent carditis, recurrences on occur, and you require a very early surgery. So now you need to substantiate. Once you've done your clinical thorough examination in the all the forms of major and the minor uh, major criteria, the five major commandants, as they say, you now need to confirm it by three of the either methods. One is a positive throat culture, or you do a positive rapid streptococcal antigen test, or what we commonly use, the ASO and ADB levels. Now, lab diagnosis, the thought culture, as I said, 11 to Agglutination elevated in 80% reaches a maximum in two to three weeks after infection at plateaus around three to six months and disappears in six to 12 months. So ASO gives you a roughly a long duration of when it is elevated. But compared to that, in Korea, of course, ASO can go down and you may not find it to be elevated for so long. And then you probably require ADB. So we'll touch upon that. The throat cultures are negative in as another series, another paper says 75% at the time of manifestation. Even rapid antigen is also commonly negative. Increase in the titer from acute to convalescent, at least two weeks apart, is considered as the best ent evidence of antecedent gas infection. 80% of patients with documented ARF demonstrate a rise in AS titer above the upper age limit defined by the 80 percentile. Remember this number. It's not 95 percentile. Here it is 80 percent of the patient are more than 80 percentile of the ASO. 80 is the number. All that cannot be used in rheumatic activity in study in Australia. Diagnosis of post streptococcal syndrome, upper limit of ASO had a sensitivity of 73 percent, but sensitivity increased to 95 percent when you add ADB. And hence the game concept of serial and parallel testing. I'll touch upon that as I go ahead. So these are the cutoffs for Indian. I, there are another slide on the non-endemic areas, but I thought I'll just talk about the endemic areas today. So in the age group, the ASO cutoffs and the ADB cutoffs, as would be applicable for India, as per these guidelines, um, uh, were these. So again, you can see that 276 is something that you expect in children, but in a lot of Indians, you'll find it in the ranges of 200, 200 plus. Uh, so we actually don't follow this, though this is what is accepted norm internationally. In our part of the world, we roughly go by 250. So 250 in adults and 333 in children is what has been proposed by our seniors and has been practiced. Again, again, a paper from Dr. Tandon, another paper from Madam Saxena, both of them again talking about these cutoffs. Adult preschool children, less than 85, schooling 170, they mentioned, but in India, we do simple 250 and 333. Rising titers are more specific. Specificity is 93%. Results alter with antibiotics, steroids, liver uh, uh, disease, and bacterial contamination, etc. Uh, so these are two important questions as to when would you get a false positive ASO? You get it in liver disease due to high levels of serum beta lipoprotein. And contamination, you will also get it in when the the sample is contaminated by Bacillus cereus or Pseudomonas. Uh, why is ASO uh, uh, not a reliable? The combination of ASO with free cholesterol and epidermal decreases the antigenicity. 
So enzymes that can be used are multiple ASO, ADBA, anti-allogenase, streptokinase. I'll just skip that. And you can do serial and parallel testing. You ADA levels of more than 300. And these are the anti-streptozyme tests, which is five antigens. Acute phase reactants would include ESR, CRP, ECG, prolonged PR, tachycardia. Advantages of ADB is DNAs would be that, that when ASO is negative in acute rheumatic fever, especially after skin infection, no false positives of liver disease. It increases irrespective of site, degree of rise and duration of rise is more than ASO. And so ASO remains for three to four months. NT DNAs B is for three years and streptokinase was five weeks to four, weeks, four years. ESR versus CRP, ESR can be falsely elevated in anemia, falsely low in CSF, CRP is always unaffected by these two conditions. ECG, you will find sinus tachycardia, commonest manifestation in Parkinson's series was sinus arrhythmia, commonest AV conduction abnormality in 32% was PR prolongation. Clinical would be rub, murmur, cardiomegaly, new onset of heart failure, and Gary Coombs. This is Vasan series and ACO, I'll just skip that. These are the papers under the old criteria, though they did not talk about ACO for a quite some time. But as you can see, the new guidelines, including the Australian New Zealand guidelines and in the Indian working group guidelines, though did not talk about it in 2008, 2012, almost everybody was talking about including ACO as a criteria. And the ACO, I'll just uh, come quickly, that World Heart, uh, World Heart Federation ACO criteria for valvitis which was published in 2012, in less than 20 years, definite RHT is suspected when pathological MR, at least two morphological features of RHT and multivalvular uh, mitral valve are present, MS gradient more than four, pathological AR or two morphological features of RHT of the aortic valve, borderline disease of both aortic and mitral valve. This is when you either A, B, C or D is present, any one of them would definitely fall into RHD. While MR that does not meet all the four echo criteria, which is physiological AR or MR, would exclude the same. So you have to define in patients more than 20 pathological MR, at least at least two morphological features of RHD, which is mitral valve, P gradient more than four, pathological AR with age less than 35, and pathological areal, at least two morphological features of RHD MR would again fall into a definitive RHD. These are some Vijayas eco criteria, which is again the scoring, and then you add to it and then decide. This is tissue Doppler imaging. This is one of our own paper where we now tissue Doppler is being used for, we looked at the peak systolic myocardial velocity. We looked at the late diastolic velocities. We also looked at tissue tra strain rate imaging and how ECHO has evolved now in uh, uh, diagnosing uh, rheumatic heart disease, including rheumatic fever. This is another paper from Dr. JC Mohan talking about systolic AR and diastolic MR. Though this paper did not talk diastolic MR, but these are the two terminologies, but beyond the scope of the talk today. I'll skip it, but these are the things that can happen in acute MR. This is another paper from Dr. Kelker and Dr. Charan, which talks about LV in early inflow and outflow indices in rheumatic MR. So basically coming to treatment, there are four goals. You need to provide symptomatic relief for acute fever, eradicate group AV time alertic, give prophylaxis and future gas infection, progression prevention, and provision of education for the patient. Profile access involves single injection of benzathine penicillin according to weight, not age. Weight more than 27, less than 27 decides whether you get 12 lakhs or 6 lakhs. Of course, the alternative is erythromycin. There is one paper where they compared erythromycin versus penicillin. And in India, they found out erythromycin doesn't do the prophylactic work, though it works very well in treatment. Treatment of cardiacus would include bed rest, salt restriction, dejection, diuretics people talked about. But aspirin and steroids, they form the primary basis of treatment. So arthritis with mild carditis, usually aspirin, those you must remember 100 milligram per kg per day, divided in four to five days for two to three weeks, tapered to 60 to 70 milligram per kg per day on symptom resolution. And 12 weeks, they have to be continued. You can use naproxen in, if the aspirin sensitivity is there. In moderate or severe carditis, what we use is prednisolone, two milligram per kg per day for two weeks followed by tapering. And then you have to continue for three to weeks. And then you may substitute with aspirin later on. In non-responder, you can try IV methylprednisolone as per the consensus statement of Pediatric ARF and Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Some questions on penicillin. What is the therapeutic level of penicillin? Dose, it is 25 nanograms per ml. What percentage of patients get therapeutic level of penicillin after three to four weeks? After three weeks, it's 56%. After four weeks, it is 33%. And hence, you have that another question coming in as to why three weeks and why not four weeks that you can give penicillin? Why not month? Why weekly for prophylaxis? Uh, injectable penicillin reinfection rates is 16%. Uh, 
uh, uh, recurrent rate is 0.6%, uh, oral is 16, in injectable is 6%. Every 21 days, because serum levels, there are some studies by Liu et al. Their compliance rate is high. Even there is latency period, which is found in the Fort Forwin study, where they showed that the recurrence is at 19 days. Prophylaxis yields a mortality benefit, yes, because the mortality in patients, are not on prophylaxis, is 3 to 0.4 percent, but mortality in prophylaxis is only 0.6 percent. This is 8.4 year data followed by Liu et al. Statistically, 3.14 injections of benzathenpilin given secondary prophylaxis avoids one hospitalization. Reactions to penicillin is only 0.012 to 0.08% per 100 injection, that is. And deaths is only 0.003 to 0.008. Again, this is WHO study. Benzathine penicillin prophylaxis does it reduce occurrence of infective endocarditis? No, it has remained the same in rheumatic fever. Um, again, another question, what is the recurrence rate? Uh, oral versus sulfonal. This is Stolerman series, Sanyal series, Penstein and Wood et al. The numbers are there. And what are the risk factors? So aspirin versus steroid, though traditionally it has been done that you give arthritis kill aspirin and carditis kill steroid. But this is in a meta-analysis not found to be true. There is no difference in either of the two when the those study was underpowered. And you can, some people have tried IVIG, but it doesn't work. Rheumatic profile access, rheumatic recurrence, rheumatic relapse and rebound are three different terms. Recurrence is after eight weeks of stopping therapy. Relapse is defined as worsening of rheumatic fever on treatment. And of carditis occurs in 4%. Rebound is defined as occurring on being tapering the anti-inflammatory drugs. These are the uh, duration of therapies, which you all know. I don't think I need to touch upon 10 or until 40 years on late adulthood. So once you have in India, we have to follow probably a lifelong profile axis. There is a term called chronic rheumatic fever, which was defined by Taranta and Feinstein, which is when the inflammatory activity persists beyond 223 days. They defined a term called chronic rheumatic fever. It occurs in 3% of rheumatic population. Last two slides. Co-pathogen effect, which is defined by Brook et al., explains persistence of gaps in throat despite penicillin. This is repeated penicillin may shift the oral flora to a persistence of beta step lactamase producing microflora like death, which can degrade the penicillin and hence the gaps can come back. Eagle effect, it reprints the app after rapidly dividing, gaps can reach a stat stationary uh, phase of the growth. In absence of active growth, penicillin may not be bacteriocidal. This is called as uh, the eagle effect. So GAPS is defined as tolerant if MIC is more than 30 MIC by MIB. And people have started even statins and rheumatic because of time constraint. I'll not touch upon it. It can go on and on. Rheumatic fever itself is a long topic. I tried to do justice to as much as I could, including I cannot end by vaccines because this is the era of vaccine and everybody's thinking and waiting for a vaccine, though not rheumatic, but COVID. But these are the various types that people are studying, the type M, non-specific type, passive, vaccines being evaluated, vectors. And these are the references based on which I have to minimize because everything that I've spoken are quoting based on certain references. The reason of this slide partially in a lighter note is that somebody had answered something from my book and the examiner said, Ye se pada? and he said, Kamal Sharma to usko bahut padi thi. So, <laughs> so I, he should have said that there are references for whatever he's saying and that references are also there in this book. Thank you very much. Thank you for patient hearing. I know rheumatic fever for one and a half hour is actually a very long topic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kamal, uh, for a very, very exhaustive review. Thank you so much. I think we have loads of questions uh, from our panelists also. Another thing, and I would just start by asking a very simple question that many other people are uh, just uh, writing to me. And then Dr. Sebel, uh, Dr. Tarun, Dr. Safal, Madam, Dr. Ramesh Arora, and my colleague, Dr. Grish, will take over. And uh, they are asking that uh, the, what is the reason that uh, penicillin profile excess is recommended every three to four weeks? Every one of them is asking that. Uh, yeah. So, is, so I, I showed that slide, but I'll just repeat for the sake of it. See, number one, what decides tissue levels? Tissue levels is determined by urinary excretion of penicillin. So when you do look at the urinary excretion of penicillin, you'll find that it continues to excrete up to three weeks. Beyond third week, the urinary excretion of penicillin stops, which means that the tissue level of the penicillin is not there, number one. Number two, Liu et al. did a meta-analysis and did a study. He compared four groups. One was uh, to uh, double the dose, which is not 1.2, but 2.4. He thought that's give that. Then he compared with three weeks with four weeks. And he found out that what caused least recurrence was 1.2 every three weeks. Number three, is the serum level. 
so serum levels we know is around 25 which is has to be maintained so serum though starts disappearing beyond 7 days but tissue levels as i said when urinary excretion with the depo preparation will continue to happen third is the latent period with the latency as we know the mean duration is 19 days so once the first latent period gets over your second penicillin comes in and third uh, because of these four reasons primarily the therapy is 3 weeks not 4 weeks though in western country they have continued to use in some centers at 4 weeks but as i said the proof of the pudding lies in eating so the trials that have been comparing have talked about 3 weeks and hence 3 weeks. thank you thank you uh, over to the panelists please dr sebel uh, please you were uh ek uh mohit Uh, that was a pretty ex exhausting review, and I think uh, so many points needs to be remembered. But uh, I think I just was listening, and I think some points which needs to be highlighted, and especially from the exam point of view, is the role of echocardiography. You see, the subclinical carditis now it has been taken as a major criterion. and uh, while uh, clinical carditis we know so subclinical carditis is an entity where you should know what are the criteria that has been laid down for diagnosing subclinical carditis and uh, if you yeah and in subclinical and that uh, the slide which was shown about the world heart federation criteria for diagnosing definite origin and here you must remember that uh, subclinical carditis how what are the things you should look for actually subclinical carditis uh, the things are there is if there is a first attack of rheumatic fever you don't expect thickening of the leaflets and you don't expect restricted mobility of the valves and so there has been this whf criteria was basically for chronic rhd but in that jones criteria which was uh, published in 2015 they also gave a exhaustive review on the criteria for acute carditis and there you don't have you don't look for thickness you don't look for restricted mobility basically there is an acute inflammation so there is annular dilatation and there is excessive mobility of the valve leaflets and there may be prolapse as you had said leading to mr eccentric mr or there may be a tear plain leaflet caudal tear so these are the points you should remember when you are asked about this criteria in background of acute rheumatic carditis and another thing is the looking for nodules that is also mentioned and that has been described very well by dr vijay lakshmi and yeah i, I agree i agree completely agree the, with the point uh for the sake of time i uh, actually yeah. skipped so this is the slide if you can see focal nodules yeah, that's my I, yeah. I, i'm just adding up the things i felt is very uh, your was very exhaustive i'm just adding the tits and bits because these are very important because now eco is going to play a major role see there is a, a background streptococcal infection diagnosis you see now the carditis uh, now you see polyarthritis with subclinical carditis Oria subclinical carditis. If you have carditis, now you must remember about all the manifestations are self-limiting except carditis. That can the valvulitis and has its sequelae, and so the sequelae of prophylaxis comes. And in chronic R, and when you are treating RHD, again these two terms you must know clearly: definite RHD and borderline RHD. And I would like to add uh, uh, two more things. that uh, you may be asked in the exam about uh, 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 any indian series uh, you mentioned about the rheumatic study where madam saxena had done with modified who's criteria but this is the first study uh, e rheumatic which was done in around 16000 school growing children and this is the largest study till date in the world and here she had used with whf criteria and as per this criteria if you are asked about the prevalence of rhd it is 7.7 per 1000 where she has shown that it is 5.5 per 1000 is having borderline rhd two are having definite rhd and by going by our classical clinical criteria it comes to around 0.36 per 1000 so if you have to take the eco criteria in the perspective obviously your prevalence incidence all are going up 
almost 10 to 20 times. This is what you have to remember. And another interesting paper came up actually, where what do you do about this subclinical carditis? Subclinical means there are no clinical features and you may not have any uh, history of definite acute rheumatic fever. Obviously you don't have it in 50% of the cases also. And then these cases have term has topped up subclinical carditis and this screening of school children then showed this morphological abnormalities in the mitral and the aortic valves. Then as you showed the criteria for definite and borderline. And another study, I would say, if someone asks you, what is the natural history? I mean, should we put these patients on prophylaxis? If they are a definite RHD, but clinically it is not seen, you have to place them on rheumatic prophylaxis with benzathine penicillin. What about the patients with borderline RHD? So borderline RHD, whether we should put them or not, either what you were saying, you put them on prophylaxis for a year, or you keep them under close surveillance, looking for their progression to definite RHD, and then you may uh, start the prophylaxis. And recently now in May, there has been a publication from Brazil where they have followed 200 school-going children with borderline rheumatic heart disease as well as definite rheumatic heart disease for two years. This is an important question which you may be asked. What is the natural history of these cases? And those which have a definite RHD, they were not on any profile axis. Only if four of the children were on profile axis. Those with definite subclinical RHD, it was shown that 50% and it was a two-year follow. So over the two years, they saw that 50% of the patients didn't show any progression, even in absence of prophylaxis. 20% showed regression to normal level, normal valve morphology. 20% they became borderline. That is, they also showed regression. And in some cases, there was a diagnostic error. But more interesting is the borderline. Now, borderline cases. 20% of them showed progression to definite rheumatic heart disease, okay? And 50% had regression to normal and rest limit static. So what they say, once you have patients with borderline RHD, based on your ECHO criteria, no clinical manifestations, one in five of them can progress to rheumatic heart disease. So should we put them on uh, profile axis? Well, that is a question that has not yet been answered, which needs to be settled by trials. But in our country, where the prevalence is high, even in this borderline cases, I feel we should initiate should profile access and follow them up. Absolutely. I think these are the points which I thought I should add up into your exhaustive, very exhaustive discussion. Thank you. Yeah. There, um, uh, uh, any other I questions from the, other panelists or any other comments? Good. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is one more, as he said, there's one, this Brazil series that he mentioned, and the other one is from South Africa. So there are two studies and both of that shown, including there was one previous study which Vasan did. Vasan also actually showed that there is this subclinical subgroup actually ended up with progression. And that's why the role of echocardiography becomes very important. And I think uh, that point is very valid. And uh, I think very, thank you for highlighting that. It's very important for residents to understand that now with COVID or no COVID as stethoscope goes uh, gets replaced by yeah, yeah, yeah. probes. I think that time will have to come when you'll have to look at those subgroup of uh, subclinical carditis. Dr. Kamal, this is a wonderful presentation. You covered you, every Dr. part Dr. of it. Like, like it's a like revision for us. You covered all the parts. Are you know any subgroups in which there is faster progression of rheumatic heart disease, like recurrence of rheumatic fever, younger age of onset? So these are the subgroups in which they have like uh, more likely to, to develop rheumatic heart disease. Yeah, so uh, I again skipped that slide. Uh, you picked it up very well. So there is a group uh, which is very well defined as to who will get more recurrences, who are at higher risk of recurrences. So these are the patients uh, uh, who will get that. One will be the younger patients because, of course, they will live longer. Secondly, the patients, certain uh, genetic traits. Genetic traits would include uh, like Australian Aborigines, uh, like patients who have... Uh, uh, CD4 receptor up, up regulation. So those are some of the subgroups which have higher recurrence rate, more severe progression, those not on profile access, those who have underlying carditis in the first episode itself. So those have been classically identified as subgroup where the recurrences are always more. Uh, I think it's a very valid question. It's very commonly asked again in exam that who are the patients who are more likely to have recurrences. So I think that slide was there, but I just skipped it quickly.
the slide. So, well, Dr. Safar, yeah. madam, so is present there the existing valvular disease, time since last attack, number of previous attacks, younger age, severity of symptoms, oral prophylaxis versus injectable. Any other comments or questions, Dr. Giri? I have uh, yeah. a large number of questions coming from the participants. And most if we can have very brief answers, sir, that will be yeah. because so we have to log off within five, seven minutes. Yeah. Most of these have already been touched upon, but I think if somebody lost concentration even for a second, then that person missed that part. So that is how these are coming. Uh, first is uh, uh, to start with the dose of aspirin for polyarthritis. You've shown that slide in quite detail. I think it's just a uh, so, yeah, for the shortage of time, maybe for the last part, I was very quick and maybe they missed out. But it's you remember a figure of 100 and then you've done the justice. If you think anything less than if you remember antiplatelet angioplasty wala dose, then you're in soup. So at least don't make that mistake in exam. Shock. And that's all examiner is interested in. You may say two weeks, three weeks, three months. Wo usme koi nobody bothers much. But your 100 mg per kg is more important. You also touched upon this. Any comparative study between injectable penicillin versus oral penicillin for secondary yeah, yeah. So there were a lot of them. I actually had some of the slides and good that uh, CSI Delhi is doing a wonderful job of having it on YouTube and then you can re-go to the slides and they're asking my slide set also. And the third <laughs> scenario, of course, is my book. I'll try to ensure that through CSI Delhi or through the sponsors, our knowledge partner, Intas, it reaches everybody. But there are a lot of studies and they all have shown that any day, injectable is always better than oral. Oral does not do the wonders that injectable does. So it has to be benzathine and I've shown the percentages also, 6% versus 16% and all that. Actually, sir, it's a Irvington House study which was initially undertaken. He has compared all the drugs like oral penicillin, Absolutely. injectable penicillin, sulfonamides and erythromycin. So, Injectable penicillin is by having lowest, like nearly 0.8 percent. Absolutely. Then higher I think nearly 2.8 percent, and subsequently 5 percent and 12 percent. Uh, for my 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 students, I tell them that if you don't remember anything, then remember those studies. Remember the Irvington House cohort and Stolerman series. Just remember those two. Don't say anything. 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 Ma'am, any uh, comments from your side? Yes. Uh, Ma'am, as uh, the largest series in the world on rheumatic heart disease, balloon or what me, I remember doing, assisting when Dr. Sebel and, you know, Grief, uh, myself and Grief were residents. So, <laughs> Ma'am, any comments from your side, Ma'am? Yes, yes. I have yes. comments on that. And uh, they are that uh, everything has been covered extensively. Are you hearing me? Yes, uh -huh. everything has been covered extensively, right from what we have been teaching to the students yes, since yes, the 1970s and onwards, and up to the literature so far we have. One thing about the echocardiography, which Cybel has been taken as a major criteria, still WHO Federation has not yet taken Dr. Vijay's criteria as to uh, be no. added the Jones criteria, although it's a very good diagnostic test because 17% of the patients are subclinical. One thing I have to say that we as clinicians have forgotten rheumatic fever, although it has declined, the prevalence has been shown to be declining and the cases are less. But still in the high socioeconomic group, I have seen a lease of mine bringing the child and the child was having sore throat for three weeks which was being treated or untreated, and the child developed florid rheumatic heart disease with severe MR and a cardiomegaly of 70%. This is very recent, about three months back. And since we have all forgotten how to treat acute rheumatic fever, then over enthusiasm of the clinician had given both prednisolon and aspirin in the those which has been just described by Kamal, one of them has to be given. If it is a florid one, then prednisolone. But don't be in a hurry to add both the things together. And after one month, the child developed peptic ulcer, which ruptured, and the child had to be operated for that. So this is my plea that when you see sore throat, first treat it very carefully. It should not be taken lightly, even nowadays. 
and dot two in also a high social economic group anyone can develop although it's a disease said said to be of low social economic group and don't be in a hurry to add so many things then about the disappearance of the murmur now we have echo of course but in my own experience and we had published in indian heart journal in 1983 and that was that those with florid carditis 15% only of mr and 11% of er also disappeared one of my professor when i was a resident gave me a patient and said this child needs mvr the child never came for mvr and after four years when the child came child never had any murmur cardiomegaly was not there and i can tell you that one has to wait and see rather than to go early for intervention of mvr also in this study this is what i have to add because rest of all has been described from the literature and very well described by kamal i must congratulate him thank, thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you uh, yes safal any question uh, before, of, uh, and then you... before we finish there's a very cute question that i have to ask the question is a request that sir could i have could i have four series that i can quote in my exams for incidence and prevalence of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease because there were so many there this is a very <laughs> yeah, yeah. question i think we need to yeah, yeah. i think you can i think you can talk about icmr series uh, is one because nobody would examiner who himself would have some publications i'm sure so <laughs> when you say icmr it is above everybody else that's what one i say but i think dr negi has done some wonderful review of literature so if you don't remember any name you can mention dr negi's review of literature published in iha in 2019 or 20 which includes all series so you can say dr negi's paper in indian heart journal which was a review of all the literature shows that so that's one of the trick of answering the thing but but there is no other way you can you know sh- cut short the names all of them there is a huge study done by everybody dr negi has done some good research from himachal for all the series is from his end but he's done a good compilation negi et al was the author and i'm sure some of you were also author to that chapter which mentioned all the prevalences all those incidences is the prevalence across. decreasing oh. or something that yeah. is the yeah. data yeah. it's a review yeah. kind of a article a review, review article yeah in yeah review article uh, of dr negi published in indian heart journal mm-hmm. 2019 yeah. thank you uh, so much dr kamal and uh, my just small addition to it is there is a beautiful article that has been published in uh, 2017 in nejm which talks about the global regional and national burden of rheumatic heart disease you can go through the percentages another one is published in the lancet which is very much available that is from already institute of medical science it's a beautiful review article and then there is a beautiful review article from dr vijay lakshmi so you can jot down the percentages and i believe there are numerous data which is very difficult to remember some important data you can remember and all these things will be also available on internet so dr kamal thank you so much for joining us today thank you thank like, you to have me thank you to and, yeah, me and i you. also uh, extend my sincere thanks to uh, madam respected madam dr aroda respected dr sevel my colleagues dr girish dr safal and uh, dr tarun and uh, our respected dr cp roy and most importantly you all who have joined us today on this journey i would like to mention i would also thank uh, intas for giving us an uh, uh, giving us unrestricted academic support for organizing this uh, beautiful webinars and next week we are going to present to you one of the greatest teachers of all time dr daya sagar rao he has kindly agreed after a long time and he will be speaking to us on constrictive pericarditis or cystic restrictive cardiomyopathy he is one of the phenomenal teachers who is very sought after and uh, i think it will be a great learning for all of us so till then i am the, on the behalf of delhi csi and the ec meeting i uh, ec committee i take leave from all of you thank you for joining us thank Good. you very much thank you thank you okay. thank you